turn our Bibles to the book of Ephesians, or the letter to the Ephesian church, chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Today I will be talking about synergy in ministry. Uh, I hope you're not getting bored by this word synergy, but you're getting excited, isn't it? If you're like me, I'm, every time I'm hearing synergy, I just feel excited because the Lord has a message for all of us. Amen? Synergy in ministry, and we'll take our reading from Ephesians 4, verse 11 to 16. The Bible says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Praise the name of the Lord. And before we say a prayer, I just want to welcome you. I was praying and the Lord just led me to know that he has a plan to bless us. Amen. He has a plan to grow us as the church to the next level. There are, there are levels that we have never attained. And the Lord was opening my eyes to see that it's because of the barriers that we have put between ourselves and, in, in, uh, between ourselves and him. And the Lord led me to know that we need to break barriers so that we can go to that level as a church where he wants us to go. There are levels of ministry that God wants us to go to, but it is until we break barriers. Even the protocols of how we worship, we must break those protocols and access the throne of heaven that the Father wants us to access. We have, when we come to the house of God, there are barriers we put. Even the things that are going on in our lives, we carry them to the church. And the Lord then is not able to dispense his grace, his grace upon us because we have barriers. I want to welcome you to just go before the Lord and break the barriers. Even if you have lost your job, break that barrier. And allow the Lord to have access to your heart as he releases his word because this word is powerful and effective. He wants to penetrate your heart and soul. Whatever barrier in your family, you're facing divorce, your, your, your children are doing whatever they are doing, you're suffering, break that barrier and create an avenue that the Lord may come through your heart, touch you, and minister to you. Let the power that is attached to the word of God begin to minister to you. We are looking forward to a church where even through the song, chains begin to fall off. In the name of Jesus, I'm expecting to see people going before the Lord and breaking barriers and releasing themselves to him and asking him, come, come Lord Jesus, my heart is open to your word. When our G.O. tells us to lift our Bibles and to make some confessions, I tell you it's not a tradition. You are who the Bible says you are this morning. And you can do 
that which the Bible says you can do. In Jesus' name, Father, I break every barrier of heaviness in my heart, even the barrier of sin, you who is here, and you have been actively involved in sin. That is a barrier that the Lord wants to break. You who has been following protocol and things and building things and religion around your life. The Lord wants you to break that protocol and those barriers that it may penetrate your heart and ministry. The Lord wants to get into your ministry. The ministries that you are involved in. The Lord wants to get into the choir and do a new thing and take them to a higher height. But it is until barriers are broken. Hallelujah. Father, we submit to the authority of your word this morning. Break this bread of life and serve us, O oh Lord, because we are ready to eat and to grow in it. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you. Before I talk about the topic of study, I want to say that the letter to the Ephesian church was written by Paul himself. And Paul wrote this letter while he was in a prison in Rome. And I want to tell you that there are levels that the Lord wants us to get to, such that what is going on in our lives does not matter. It doesn't matter what is happening to you. You could be in a prison, in your family, in your workplace, in your ministry, but it doesn't matter. The word of God is paramount in our lives. And, you know, instead of Paul taking a seat and praying and crying to God, why am I in chains? Because, of, you know, I wasn't... A criminal, it's just because I was sharing your word, and that's why I'm in prison. He didn't pity himself. He put the word of God ahead of everything. He never wrote this message from a place of comfort. He wrote it from a place of pain while in a prison in Rome. When I hear the tone of the message to the church in Ephesus, I hear a man who is in the labor ward trying to deliver a child. The women will understand. And Paul broke protocols of literature. He broke protocols of writing. He said, I will do it my way because something has to be backed in the church of Ephesus. And that's why when I read the letter to the Ephesian church, I see him. Even the way he begins writing, it is not according to the writing rules. He broke every protocol. He put a lot of commas. I think as I was reading, I was trying to look for a place where I can breathe. Because he put commas, he put commas, no full, full stops. I think in the passage that I have read, there are only two full stops. Because he is in labor. He wants to birth. He wants to release something so that the church can grow to maturity. Grow up in stature and appear to God as a bright without spot or wrinkle. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. And Paul uses a, the word mystery. He says this is a mystery. Not because he wants to prove that it is difficult to understand, but he wants to say this thing that has been concealed or hidden in a long time or for a long time, I want to make it clear to you. I want to rip it open so that you understand. That is the tone of the letter. And he writes to the Ephesian church, he says in, in, in Ephesians chapter 1, where we find the first mystery. He has mentioned mystery 
in this little epistle six times because it was important for him to deliver the message. In chapter number one, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Hallelujah. Breathtaking. Even as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love, he predestined us. Praise the name of the Lord for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. And verse number nine says, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which is set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. And it goes on and on and on. The first mystery is the mystery of his will. That God is willing to save humanity. By the way, we never chose him. He chose us. According to his will. And the word choice blew my mind. Looking at God, looking at Jesus before the foundations of the earth, before I was created, before I was put in my mother's womb, he knew me and chose me. What a mystery. What a privilege. The same way you go to the shop, you look at a shoe, you say, not that one, not this one, and you pick another. That is what God did for you. Praise the name of the Lord. And in chapter number two, I won't go into the reading because of my time, but it talks about the mystery of oneness in Christ, which now spills over even to chapter number three. And I tell you that there, it is a mystery for me to call Reverend Jimmy my brother. He's a lawyer by no Chance, is he my brother? It is a mystery. But we've been born by God and born of God. And therefore, we are brothers. Praise the name of the Lord. It is a mystery. And I tell you, church, if we break the barriers of hatred between or amongst ourselves, we shall understand the tone of this passage and become one in Christ Jesus. We are many different people from different places speaking different languages. Internationals are in our church. But you know what? Whether you're from Nigeria or Congo, you're my brother. It's a mystery. That is what Paul is talking about here. And we see another mystery the mystery of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ revealed. This man, Paul, is the one that was persecuting the church. And one time, when he was going to Damascus, he met the owner of the church. I want to tell you something. This church belongs to Jesus Christ. This church has got an owner. And that honor is Jesus Christ. So Paul meets, meets uh, uh, Jesus on the road. And, go, you know, Jesus strikes him, knocks him down. He could no longer persecute the, the church of Jesus Christ. And he revealed the mystery of the, of, of, of the gospel that brings salvation. There was a war between the Jews and the Gentiles, because the Jews are feeling superior. They have a place in the kingdom. They are the chosen generation. They are the royal priesthood. They are the people of God. And therefore, they know for sure that they are the ones who are supposed to receive the gospel. The Gentiles are not supposed to come near them. 
The Gentiles could not, they were not allowed even to get into the temple. But Paul sees a mystery. That this gospel has also been released to the Gentiles. Praise the name of the Lord. The mystery of his word. The fourth ministry I see in our chapter of study this morning. The mystery of unity and love. Hallelujah. I want to say to us, church, that we have to love one another as brothers and sisters in the Lord. We have to be united as the body of Jesus Christ. Today, if you hurt your toe, your mouth will scream. Because it's united. The toe, the toe cannot cry. But the mouth cries. It is first of all registered in the brain. And then you cry. And here Paul wants the church to know. That you may be the leg of the church. She may be the mouth of the church. I may be the hand of the church. But all of us must work and synergize together in unity and in love to deliver the people of God from all these waves and winds of doctrine. Our work is to grow the church into maturity in the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Synergy was explained to us by Gio and I know that you already know the dictionary meaning and everything and theological meaning. But I want to say synergy is the combined power of a group of things when they are working together that is greater than the total power achieved by each working separately. If you work alone, I gave an example in the morning, let me use it again because pastor didn't rebuke me when we took a break. So when I came in the morning, the gate man opened the gate for me. And I was received here in the boardroom. When I came in, I found a person praying. And when he finished praying, the music, the worshipers came and sang. And then the choir came and sang. And then the, the worship leader, our pastor here, led the service. And then Gio came to bring the word. And then Joyce preaches. When I'm done, I will give it back to Gio. Is that synergy? Yes. Can you imagine if Pastor Alan was the one to receive me at the gate, take me there, carry my bag, bring it here, do, do the prayer, do the worship. I can see you're already tired. There is no synergy there. You would be bored. But we are working together and fitting Amen. properly. So that you enjoy the service and that's why you come back. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. We are so blessed. We have everyone here. And let me tell you, let me surprise you. That everyone in this ministry is important. Amen. It doesn't matter who you are and what you do. You are so important to God and to us. Synergy. So we are going to work together. I won't go into the introduction because I have already done that. Why is synergy in ministry important? Because we are living in perilous times. There is a lot of lies, waves of doctrines, winds of doctrine. We have so many people. And if you are there today, do not repeat there are so many people who are wounded in this world and they keep visiting the covens and the, 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 the witch doctors and they are looking for a solution. You is looking for a solution elsewhere. There is a solution here. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. But it's only because we are not synergizing and working together. And that's why we are going everywhere and wandering everywhere. We will be wounded. We have to synergize and work together. And this working together will produce a perfect man and woman of God. 
Because our work is to build the believer to maturity. The church is being faced with a lot of problems. From deception, Matthew 24, to worldliness, 2 Timothy chapter 3. And therefore, we have work to do as the church of Jesus Christ. We must synergize in ministry. Hallelujah. We need to grow towards maturity and grow in love for the Lord. Hallelujah. So Paul talks to the church in Ephesus and he tells them that in verse number nine, verse number eight, let me read verse number eight. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Hallelujah. Jesus ascended to heaven and he gave gifts to men. And he says in saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth. He who descended is the one also who ascended far above the heavens that he might fill all things. Everything finds its completeness in the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything works for Jesus Christ. Everything works because of Jesus Christ. Everything finds completeness and wholeness in Jesus Christ. So even in our synergy in ministry, even your song as you sing it, it should be because of Christ and for Christ, not for you. We understand. So he went down to hell when he died. And he found some men who were held captives. And he freed them. He set the captives free. Those people who had, di who had died before Jesus Christ and had been buried. You know, in those times, before Jesus died, there were two places that man would go after death. And when I say man, it's man and woman. So you either go to paradise or you go to hell. And so Jesus gives us an example of Lazarus and rich man. When the, both of them died, one went to paradise, the other one to hell. And we see there is no synergy in hell, I tell you. The rich man tried to synergize with Lazarus. Take some water and drop it in my mouth. You know, it was, no, there's no synergy here. Synergy is here when you are existing. Don't wait to die to go and synergize elsewhere. It is here and now. He said, no, it's not possible. You stay there. He tried to bribe with words. I want to go and tell my brethren to accept this gospel. Uh -uh. They heard the prophets, they refused. Today they have listened to Joyce, they have refused. So even if they die, even if you resurrect and tell them, they won't listen to you. So that scripture is found in uh, Psalms 48 where Jesus went down. And I tell you, when Jesus resurrected the graves, when he died, the graves were opened. And all those men who had been there for a long time, they were released. And they were seen walking the streets of Jerusalem. Right. I tell you, only the saints were resurrected. Right. If today you die a sinner, there is no resurrection for you. You will not be a partaker of the rapture. Right. You will not see what will happen when we are going to be with Jesus, because you will remain dead. Even when the saints will be resurrected, when Christ shall come, you will remain dead and die there. Until we go be with Jesus seven years, we come back with him, rule with him a thousand years. Happened the Otafufuliwa. And you will not be resurrected to enjoy 
you will be resurrected to sit before the white throne judgment of the Lord. And then you will be thrown to the lake of fire. The time is now. There is no any other time for salvation. There is no salvation elsewhere. It is now. The decision is now. And so Jesus went there and came out with this source. And then he gave gifts to men. Hallelujah. Because of time, I would just go to the gifts. He gave some to be the apostles. And this is the governing ministry. I'll talk about the five G's of the ministry of Jesus. The governing ministry of the apostles. Then the prophets. This is the guiding ministry of the prophets. I'll talk about the evangelists. These are the gathering ministers. Then we have the shepherds and the pastors. These are the guarding ministries. And then we have, we have the last one is teachers. These are the grounding ministers. The apostle has to govern. Our bishop governs. It, it is not a sin. It is there. It, it is Jesus who gave them, who gave him that gift to govern GCI. The prophets, their work is to guide. What is the Lord saying? Because the prophetic in the Old Testament was to foretell, to tell ahead of time what God wanted done. But the prophecy of today is forth telling. Did you get my mouth? You know, sometimes as cambas we have problems. Forth telling. <laughs> Preaching is prophecy because it is forth telling what God is saying. And then the evangelists, their work is to go out there and gather the flock. And then bring to the shepherd, Pastor Jimmy here, for him to guard the flock. And then give Pastor Alan to teach and ground them in the word so that they are not tossed up and about by every wave of doctrine. We have work to do. You has been sitting there and saying there is no ministry for you. Did you find yourself somewhere? We need teachers. Amen. We need evangelists. Amen. Hallelujah. We need pastors. Oh, are they enough? No, 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 no. Okay. You have heard. We don't have enough pastors. We don't have enough prophets to forth tell the word of God. We don't have... Let me leave the other one. He will tell us when he comes on board. But I tell you, we must function together for the equipping of the saints. So that we may no longer be children tossed up and about by every wave of doctrine. The work that God has called us into is not for the clergy. We have two people in church, the clergy and the lady. If you wait for pastor to sing in the choir, I have listened to him singing and I felt that he doesn't have grace. We still need Mwaluma. You understand the synergy in ministry that I'm talking about? We need an intercessor in this ministry to get to, get to the realms of the spirit. And then we work together and produce men that cannot be lied to. I'm looking forward to a GCI that cannot go to a witch doctor. A GCI that cannot go drinking. A GCI that is not committing adultery and fornication because they are babies in the kingdom. We want grown-up men who know how to say, this one I am not familiar with. Pastors Mukonakazi. Deacons, you have work. Growth center, leaders, 
you have work until the saints reach maturity. Thank God for the leaders meeting that is coming on Saturday. I'm really looking forward. I think I will be the first one to arrive. Because the leaders, when we are given positions, because our bishop is very gracious, he has put everyone who comes in leadership. In fact, all of us are leaders. Did you know that? And when you are given the, the mandate to, to lead, it's the time to grow fat. I was using that example and the pastor rebuked me. <laughs> it is no time to grow fat because of your position in church. It's the time to grow thin. Because you have to pray for your group. Many of us, God has given a hundred sheep. I don't know how many you are in worship. Let me use Makweni. Because I know my governor loves me, he can't crucify me. But in Makweni, we have a hundred brothers. Governor Mwinzi, wherever you are, you have to produce the hundred of us before Christ. Amen. If you have lost any of us, Tafuta Torch. Look for us. Bring us to the fold. There are people who will be surprised when we go to heaven. Because you are the deacon in charge of the pastor's ministry. You have harassed the pastors and they have started leaving. How will you appear before the Lord? Our ministries must grow us thin. As we, we cry to the Lord. Pastor, I know you finished your 40 days of prayer and fasting. But if this man commits sin, you have to go to Sinai again for another 40 days. That is what happened to Moses. He went and wrote, you know, received the written law. When he came down, he found men sinning. You ministry leader, you growth center pastor, if you come from the presence of God, 40, I don't care how long you took in Kinani. You must go back to Kinani and call upon God for that calf to die, the one that has been raised in your absence. There's no enough for 40 days, Pastor Alan. I'm sorry. We will grow thin in this ministry and they break the walls of religion, break the, the walls of hatred, break the, the walls of feeling like because I am the pastor of GCI, I am greater than anyone else. That wall must come down. Because you sing well, Nduta. It doesn't mean that you occupy the space here and harass the, less, the rest of the worshippers. Those worshippers, you must usher them and present them before the Lord. If you have lost any in your ministry, it is time to wear your boots. Get a torch and look for them. You can't appear before Gio. I'm sorry, let me use you. But when you appear before Jesus, you must present Joyce. <laughs> if, if I am lost, it is Gio's responsibility. <laughs> I tell you, if you take ministry like that, we will not lose any member of GCI. Amen. If you are the cause of people leaving the church, I welcome you to repent. I welcome you to repent. We must be united. It's a mystery. It is a mystery. That's why Paul is laboring without full stop saying, so that, so that, so that, and breaking all the rules of writing. So that you get the message. What is the goal? I've repeated it enough times. These people must grow. And believers must be able to discern false doctrine. Pastor Alan, if they are not able to discern, we must go back 40 days. If they are not able to present themselves a bride without wrinkle, or spot, we must go back to Kinani. Pastor Joe, with your team, how many have you lost? Don't answer me. How many are lost? And you're saying we have finished. Let me tell you, the place where God is taking GCI is not the place of finishing 40 days. It's the place of starting another 40 days. 
until Christ is formed in every member of this ministry. We are looking forward to pastors who are praying and fasting for the flock so that we don't lose. A deacon who fasts and prays, when he comes back and finds sin, he goes back without saying to Lima, Lisa, this is not a religious activity. It is appearing before the presence of God to defend your flock. We must present them before the Lord. In conclusion, my teacher took my time. Let me suffer the pain. And that is not what he taught me. Conclusion. Christ has given each one of us gifts that they are supposed to be used for his glory. Like I said earlier, your role is not for you to fatten up. It's for you to grow thin as you labor. As you labor before the Lord so that Christ may be formed. In the morning we, we talked here and I asked whether there's somebody willing to submit their lives to Christ. Nobody came. But a young man came after that crying and told me I cannot appear before the, the crowd. Just give me that Jesus. And I was so happy to lead him to the Lord. I tell you, if you are seated here, we are not doing this for pleasure. We are laboring so that Christ may be formed in you. If you are not saved, do not sit on that seat. Come and receive Jesus. Don't leave the gate a sinner. The grace is available for you. Amen. And I tell you, saints are everywhere. In your house, in your workstation. You who is saying, I have no opportunity. You have a lot of it in your house. How many people are in your house? How many people are in your neighborhood? You have to grow them and present them. God will ask you, what were you doing in Siokimau when people are dying in sin? I tell you, until we look at this thing from the eyes of God, we will sit here and blame ourselves and blame opportunities and all that while we have a lot of people. Your work is to grow, to get to those people, evangelize to them. Get some people from your estate giving their lives to Christ and bring them to Joyce. To guard them. Give them to Pastor Alan to ground them. Give them to Pastor Jimmy to guide them. Your work is there. You is saying, I have no ministry. What are you doing with what God has given you? Have you known your gift? Are people being built up in ministry? In your ministry. Let's rise up on our feet. And go before the Lord. Present ourselves before him. And ask him to just have mercy on us. Some of us who have lost some people. Knowingly. Ignorantly. We need to ask God to have mercy on us. To unite us. To use our gifts. For the growth of the church. And not for selfish benefits. Father, I pray that you minister and touch every heart. Everyone that has come here has heard a song, has heard your word, has heard the words of encouragement. I pray, my Father, that you minister to their hearts this morning. May none leave the doors of our church still a sinner. Those who have been the ones chasing people out of church, forgive them, Lord. And bring people back to the presence of the Lord. I pray for growth and maturity in our church in the name of Jesus.